Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. The Institute of Politics is uh, very pleased tonight to uh, be sponsoring our speaker, indeed the former speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, and we're particularly appreciative of uh, one of our fellows, Ron Fournier, this semester who uh, helped make this uh, event occur. Uh, while I don't intend to infringe very much on the introduction of our speaker, I just wanted to say a word since I had the honor and pleasure of serving with him in the House of Representatives that uh, in the 1980s, um, he demonstrated uh, that there was an enormous power to ideas, to shaping those ideas into messages that were understandable to broad swaths of the American people, and to organizing and persistently sticking with what you wanted to accomplish and not just a hit and miss kind of politics that is uh, jumps from one issue and one item to another. And that persistence in that work and those ideas have paid off with a first a revolt within my impression is within the Republican Party uh, and later a revolution in the Congress that uh, brought the Republicans uh, to the majority after 40 years uh, in the wilderness. Uh, now, uh, my Democratic colleagues, uh, who have finally awakened to the fact the world changed on them, uh, they are increasingly looking back to this era and studying what this gentleman and uh, some of his colleagues uh, accomplished. Uh, their obviously intent is to replicate a different kind of revolution. But it's also my honor this evening to introduce the Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, uh, David Elwood. David is a, a quintessential uh, a member of the Kennedy, of the, uh, Kennedy School community uh, because on the one hand, he has been a, a very distinguished and, and renowned uh, scholar uh, in the fields of family, and, uh, employment, uh, in poverty, uh, uh, and in welfare. Uh, and, the, and in addition to that, not only working with the ideas and demonstrating the ideas to a broader audience, he then uh, went to Washington as Assistant Secretary of HHS and uh, engaged in the, the practical, difficult politics of making things happen, uh, where he led the President uh, Clinton's task force on welfare reform and helped to bring about uh, one of the most significant changes in American welfare law uh, in the last century. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dean David Ellis. Hello, everybody. Um, I always open these with a request that if you would like to hear the speaker, there are a couple things you might do. First, if you have a cell phone, could you turn it off or put it to vibrate or whatever else? Uh, the second aspect of this is, is the usual reminder about civility. Uh, we're here to hear the speaker and his comments. And even if you have a question or a comment, we'd love to hear your questions. Uh, but if you interrupt it during the speech or any other time, we'll obviously ask that you leave uh, so that we have an opportunity to hear them. Uh, this is an extraordinary uh, chance tonight. We're here at a forum entitled Winning the Future. Um, and uh, even in Phil's introduction, he talked about welfare reform. And I suspect the speaker might have a different view about who succeeded in making welfare reform happen. Um, and indeed, I was uh, in the Clinton administration during the remarkable period when that agenda uh, shifted. Uh, from the control uh, of the White House to the control of the Congress, and then something intermediate emerged. Uh, some years back, Richard Ru we, we've, we've had powerful politicians from Georgia uh, throughout our history, from Richard Russell to uh, Sam Nunn, uh, where our nation's capital grew accustomed to powerful leaders from there. But both, Ru both Russell and Nunn had very long careers, and they thrived under the age-old tradition of seniority and genteel politics in the nation's beltway. Um, that tradition, by the way, included Democrats controlling the South. Um, all that changed in 1978 when a 35-year-old history teacher, by the way, faculty take note, uh, from West Georgia College won in his third attempt uh, to represent Georgia's sixth congressional district in Washington, D.C. Overnight, the young professor became the highest ranking Republican official in the state of Georgia. This was just 1978. Um, the rest is history. Obviously, uh, the Old South is about to fall, and the New South uh, uh, it was about to fall to the New South, and one man, more than any other, was at the helm of that ship of state. Thomas Mann of the Brookings Institution is quoted as saying, from the moment he arrived, he began thinking in very ambitious terms of making the Republican Party the majority party in Congress, 
but also about changing the prevailing ideology of the country. What's interesting about how he did that, however, was some of it was strategic. Some of it was focusing on issues such as ethical violations of the Democrats and so forth. But more than any other thing, uh, this history professor was identified with a set of ideas, uh, clearly articulated, Phil mentioned this already, clearly articulated, thoughtful, and powerfully uh, evocative in all kinds of different respects. And with his crusade against Democrat corruption and his powerful message of an alternative, um, the Republican Party became newly energized. And uh, he became the uh, House Minority Whip, by the way, by a two-vote two margin in 1989. And then in 1990, um, uh, he uh, narrowly won re-election uh, by 1,000 votes. And in 1992, he was in a new district uh, and again was nearly defeated by a Republican challenger. But victory in hand, 1992, remember, just barely got through the Republican primary. He talked about and focused on contract with America. Believe me, those words are etched in my memory permanently. Uh, a powerful set of coherent ideas, and the notion was that, the, that people should run for Congress on a coherent national set of ideas and ideals. And sure enough, the impossible occurred. Republicans gained over 50 seats in the, uh, in the uh, 94 election, took control of the House for the first time in 40 years. And in his first 100 days as speaker, he set out to balance the budget, shrink the size of government, shift responsibility to the states, do welfare reform, and half a dozen other items. And nine of the 10 items from Contract of America did pass the House. And in, in 1995, he was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year. His success at balancing the federal budget was an accomplishment both he and President Clinton have fought to take credit for, um, just as with welfare reform. Uh, but in 1998, unfortunately, his, uh, or some might say fortunately, I suppose, but unfortunately, his tenure was cut short. Um, he resigned from his position amid criticism for the use of taxes and foundations for political purposes, and he left the House entirely in 1999. But once again, uh, this man of ideas and uh, passion has proven uh, there are second acts, and indeed, there are second and third books. And indeed, uh, his latest book, Winning the Future, a 21st century contract with America uh, is what's brought him around the country and has uh, certainly proven once again that he's one of our most provocative speakers. Um, when asked by a reporter if he might be a candidate for president in 2008, he said, for an army brat from Pennsylvania who became the only Georgia Republican in the House and the first Republican Speaker of the House in 40 years, anything is possible. Indeed, with this student of history, his bachelor's from Emory, his MA and PhD from Tulane, the final chapter clearly has not been written. So with him, anything is possible, and much will come. Ladies and gentlemen, Speaker Newt Gingrich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. As a former assistant professor, it's always a little overwhelming to be introduced by a dean. Uh, but one of the things that I do to bring myself back to reality after that kind of a strong introduction is I uh, had an event years ago that reminded me of the gap between whatever your self-image is and what really happens. When I was a very junior, relatively unknown congressman, I was invited to come to Montgomery, Alabama to do a fundraiser for Congressman Bill Dickinson, who was the ranking Republican on the Armed Services Committee. And Dickinson was sort of giving me a chance to go out and prove that I could be effective on the stump. But then he got to worrying about it because he realized that nobody in his district knew who I was. And he decided that he would bring in somebody to help sort of beef up the fundraiser. And so he called an old friend of his named Charlton Heston. <laughs> so I arrive in Montgomery, and there you've got Charlton Heston and Newt Gingrich are at the fundraiser. We both give our talks. And then they do a photo line, and people come through, and Dickinson greets them and puts them between Heston and me. And then later on, about two weeks, they send me 250 pictures to sign. And I have the very humbling experience of realizing that in 250 pictures, 
there is not a single occasion on which the woman leans towards me. <laughs> and so I always use that to sort of ground myself in, in the gap between uh, the pleasantries and reality, but I'm delighted to be here and, and uh, have a chance to talk about ideas. And I'm going to talk fairly briefly because I really want to focus more on the question and answer opportunity that we have, but let, let me start with a simple observation that may surprise you. My summary of where we are as a country is that we are faced with more challenges than at any time since 1980. Now, for the students here who may not be vividly aware of 1980, because you may not have been here in 1980, uh, let me just say, in 1980 we had 23% interest rates 13% inflation. We were moving into the deepest recession since the Great Depression. We had gasoline rationing and we had lines at gas stations. The Iranians had held Americans hostage for 444 days. The Soviet Union was on offense in Afghanistan, Nicaragua, Grenada, Angola, El Salvador, uh, and uh, the President of the United States had given a nationwide speech in which, in essence, he said, we're at the end of the American era. You can't have all these big dreams. We should get used to less. What was called the Malay speech, uh, after, actually after a professor here at Harvard, although, in fact, it, Carter never used the word Malays. Um, I cite that as background because in the summer and fall of 1980, there were really serious, deep concerns about the American experience. A Frenchman who was very pro-West and very pro-American wrote a book called The Death of the Democracies, uh, Jean-Francois Jean Ravel, and there was a general sense of pessimism and almost despair. Ronald Reagan, who had been happily on the ranch ignoring all this, uh, ran for office on the grounds um, that one of his campaign lines was, it's a recession if you lose your job, I mean, if your neighbor loses their job, it is a depression if you lose your job, and it's a recovery if Jimmy Carter loses his job. <laughs> and that was kind of, it was a very, people forget because we have this mythological view looking back at Reagan. He was, it was a very rough and tumble, tough campaign. Reagan gets elected, and he recognizes that he has to focus his energy and he picks three things. Renewing American civic culture by emphasizing that you're right to be proud to be an American, which if you read his inaugural address of 1981, is just filled with that sense. Creating economic growth by cutting taxes and uh, cutting regulation and defeating inflation. And defeating the Soviet empire. Now it's, it's hard looking back to realize what, what a bold change this was from the politics and the government of the 1970s. Everybody who was sophisticated understood in 1980 that the Soviet Union was a fact, that it was a dangerous country, a big country, and that we had to have detente, which was a fancy French word meaning get along with each other. And there were two wings of detente. There was conservative detente, which is you should yell at the, Repo at the Russians while you get along with them. And there was liberal detente, which is you should be nice to the Russians while you get along with them. But everybody in the establishment agreed you had to have detente. Reagan came along as a cowboy from the outside. A reporter asked him right after the election, what's your vision of the Cold War? And he summarized it in four words. We win, they lose. It was heretical. People like Strobe Talbert, who was an expert in the Soviet Union and wrote for Time Magazine, almost had a stroke reading it. <laughs> the entire New York Times editorial board seriously considered Harry Carey as a symbolic act of protest. There was a sense this is a madman. He's going to get us into a war. He doesn't understand foreign policy. He, he, he's a primitive. And I, by the way, the Soviet Union disappeared 10 years after his inaugural. Literally, no, nobody would have predicted this in 1981, not even the strongest Reaganite. I don't think Reagan would have predicted it. Jean Kirkpatrick told me flatly, nobody she knew in their circle thought the Soviet Union could collapse in 10 years. They thought eventually it would collapse. 1988, Ronald Reagan goes to Berlin and says something he'd actually said 
21 years earlier. In 1967, as governor, he visited Germany and said that wall should be torn down. He thought it was a good line, and as an actor, he kept all the good lines. <laughs> he came back, as, as Winston Churchill once said, many of his greatest speeches were stolen from obscure 19th century authors. Uh, there's an honor among great orators that they copy people who other people have never heard of. <clears throat> In Reagan's case, he often copied himself because he'd been around long enough he could actually invent his own material. <laughs> uh, you know, it could disappear and then come back. And, so, nice, so he goes, he writes into his speech, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. The State Department takes it out because it's offensive. There's no reason to be mean to Gorbachev. He's trying to do the right thing. Why would you crowd him? Reagan puts it back in. The State Department takes it out a second time. Reagan writes it in his own hand the third time and says to his aide, explain to them, I'm the president. They're not. It stays in. <laughs> he gets up. He says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Again, the establishment's horrified. How can you be so blunt, so direct? You're going to offend them. One year later, the wall collapsed. Now, I cite all that because I'm a student of Reagan who was an FDR Democrat. It's important to remember, Reagan was not a Republican regular. Reagan had been an FDR Democrat. FDR is the greatest political leader of the 20th century. So Reagan had studied FDR. FDR had studied his cousin Theodore. Theodore had grown up in the shadow of Abraham Lincoln. I mean, there's a lineage to how America works and why occasionally you get things that really work. And here's my proposition to all of you. We are about to face the largest scale of challenge we have had since 1980. The political governmental system in the United States is not capable of developing answers internally and never has been. There, there, there's not a single major movement in American politics that starts in Washington. They all start outside Washington. The, Jeff the, the Federalists, the Jeffersonians, the Jacksonians, the Lincoln Republicans, the progressives in Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, FDR and the New Deal Democrats, Ronald Reagan and modern conservatism. Every one of them starts first in the countryside with people talking to each other. And mostly it's common sense. We were just talking in the last, uh, in the last uh, class, I was, in Ron, I was in Ron's class, and I raised a point which is, to my amazement, made in the New York Times op-ed page today. I mean, there was a moment of brief common sense in the New York Times this morning that stunned me. I don't know who they brought in as an editor, but it's a, it's a striking moment. And this is a person who says, maybe the, the story of the Acela of the last two days ought to be enough to convince the average person in the Northeast that Amtrak doesn't work. And this is a very important question. Do you, in fact, need what you have in large parts of the world, which is some kind of contracted out, privatized, highly effective train service actually paid based on productivity? Or do we continue to find a way to pour more money into a bureaucracy that by every objective standard doesn't work? And if you, if you don't, uh, don't take this as a you know, crazed southern right-wing attitude, although I'm, you're certainly allowed to believe that. But the person that's quoted in the article spent their entire career at Amtrak and said their conclusion was it is impossible for the current government bureaucracy to ever deliver. So in that tradition, I want to talk about practical things and common sense things that you can't say in Washington. You can't say in Washington for two reasons. The first is the tyranny of the present. Washington is a city dominated by this morning's news headlines and dominated by whatever came out the gossip was last night and dominated by 24-hour cable news. And second is that the past is organized and has lobbyists. The future never does. So the weight of lobbying inside the, the national capital is always biased in favor of propping up the past because only the past has had the time to organize itself. And so you have to go out to the country and you have to, you have to make statements that hopefully are so profound and so obvious and make so much sense that people start saying to their senators and their congressmen and their presidential candidates, you know, are you going to actually be part of the 21st century or are you going to continue this baloney that you've inherited from the 20th century? And only when you get to that level of clarity do you start to see really big change, which in the six or seven great movements in American history have been really startling change. I mean, the one great virtue we have over the European system is we really can move quickly once we talk ourselves. We have to have a dialogue to do it, but once we finish the dialogue, we can move with stunning speed and make big changes. And here's my proposition you can check in your own life and think about. There are five major challenges facing the United States None of the five can be solved inside the current models. All five require transformational change on a scale that is outside the normal dialogue of Washington. The five are national security, 
math and science education, competing with China and India, dealing with the challenge of age and of an aging population, and defining the nature of American civic culture. I mean, let me talk at left, but I think these five are the largest discussions we will have in the next 10 to 15 years. And I think the longer it takes to solve them, the more pressing they'll get. Let me start with national security. I don't know how many of you noticed that about a month ago, the director of central intelligence testified to the Congress in an open meeting that was covered by the news media that he fully expects a nuclear weapon to be driven across the American border and delivered by rental truck or rental car. How, how many of you have noticed this? Just raise your, you're, not, you're nodding your head. Just raise your hand if you knew this. Okay. Ten of you, twelve of you. I want you to think about this for a second. Remember, remember all the talk about why didn't we know about 9-11? Why weren't we aware? Why didn't the government organize? Remember the whole 9-11 commission routine? You know, the, 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 all the horses have fled. Will somebody go organize a committee to explain that the barn door was open? This is a rural reference that may not make sense to some of you, but later on you can. <laughs> this is a very sophisticated school. You'll find a professor somewhere here. It also has enough gentry. You'll find people who keep horses. They'll, they'll explain it. <laughs> but, but here's my point. How much more warning do you have to get that we're in danger than to have the director of central intelligence publicly testify he believes a nuclear weapon could go off in an American city driven across the border? So where's the program? And in terms of the Democratic Party, which ought to be an effective opposition, where's the Democrat with a program? I mean, if you don't want, you, know, you can say on the one hand, how come the Bush administration doesn't have a program? How come the Democrats don't have a program? Instead, we all sit around going, well, that's really a hard one. <laughs> this is really dangerous. If we lose a city, or if we have an engineered biological, which I believe is more dangerous than a nuclear weapon, this country will be in danger of losing its freedom domestically because people will not want to live in a society that's at risk. And they will accept a level of government control which I find frightening. I am a conservative. I don't trust the government. I do not want the government to have that level of power. I don't want government attorneys to have that level of power. But we will move in that direction if we have a disaster. And yet, what are we doing about it? This report came out today about the Transportation Security Safety Administration that says their, their failure rate of finding a concealed weapon is exactly the same today it was in 1987. This actually fits back to the Amtrak story. Why would you think the Transportation Safety Administration was going to work? Remember, I have a paper, you can go to newt.org, and we have a paper there uh, on entrepreneurial public management as a replacement for bureaucratic public administration. The principle is very simple. All modern bureaucratic public administration is a mail clerk with a quill pen codified into the Civil Service Acts of the 1880s. And I sat down with people at UPS and FedEx and elsewhere, and I said, in the information age, if you wanted the convenience, flexibility, speed, efficiency, uh, and accuracy of those two companies, what, how would you have to change government? And it's breathtaking. So I would say, as government bureaucracies go, TSA is pretty reasonable. They have a person out front yelling at you to take off your shoes and your coat. They have a couple people standing around watching you. They have another couple people standing around looking at TV screens. They have other people standing in the corner talking to each other about the fact that later on they'll stand around. <laughs> Which part am I missing? But why would you take that seriously? I mean, you're relying on a really stupid opponent. Now, the second great challenge is math and science education. And, and this is when. Uh, I, President Clinton and I created the Hart-Rudman Commission in 1997 to look at American national security out to 2025. And we recruited uh, seven Republicans and seven, seven Democrats. And then when I stepped down as speaker, they were very generous and asked me to join the commission. And we spent three years studying what challenges America over the next 25 years. We reported in March of 2001 that the greatest threat to the United States was a weapon of mass destruction going off in an American city, probably by terrorists, and that we needed a preemptive doctrine, and we needed uh, a uh, Homeland Security Department. <clears throat> in March of 2001, nobody cared. News media didn't cover it. 
Two congressional subcommittees held hearings. Nobody else paid much attention. Vice President Cheney assigned one uh, uh, Navy admiral to be kind of studying uh, whether or not we should have a Department of Homeland Security, but the truth was nobody was doing anything. On September 12th, people called and said, wow, that was really a smart report. You really got it. Now remember, we did not warn about the towers, although I, having read Tom Clancy's novels, I was aware you could fly airplanes into buildings. We warned about a much bigger disaster. Add two zeros to the 3100. That's what we were warning about. But we do have, you know, we, we were moving in the right direction. What nobody paid attention to was the number two thing in the Hart Rudman Commission. We said, the second greatest threat to the United States is the failure of math and science education. And if we don't fix it, we, this, we had the following sentence that we ran by every single member. I wrote it personally, and we ran it by every member to make sure they understood how strong it was. We believe that the failure of math and science education is a greater threat than any conceivable conventional war. Now, this should really sober you. We first got this report, by the way, in 1983 in a report called A Nation at Risk, which said, our schools are so bad we are risking losing the nation. We have now spent 22 years of rope-a-dope, big talk, and more money, and nothing has changed. It's Amtrak in schools. And this is a real crisis. Now, I am delighted to say that last week, Congressman Frank Wolf and Senator John Warner introduced a bill which is one out of, we have about 30 recommendations in winning the future on math and science education. One of them was introduced as a bill last week which would waive up to $10,000 of interest on student loans for undergraduates who major in math and science. And we did it very deliberately. And this is, a, this is an argument we have to have as a country. I want to make an assertion. I'm a PhD in history. I want to make an assertion. Math and science are harder. It's a very important principle. If you intend to compete with China and India, if you intend to be part of the 21st century scientific world, you had better start rewarding math and science. This is a real profound crisis. I have two other specific examples, that, that are three examples I cite in, in, the, uh, in Winning the Future. We should create a national library of science modeled on the National Library of Medicine, which runs Medline Plus, which is an internet-based source of information, you should be able to get current scientific knowledge organized to be understandable at multiple levels, online, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, run by the National Science Foundation, probably in partnership with the National Library of Medicine, so that every person in the country who wanted to keep up with the most modern knowledge could have access to it for free, 24 hours a day, and every young person who realized that their chemistry teacher did not have a clue could actually go someplace to learn chemistry for something that actually was authoritative. That would repay itself the first week we launched it. Second, we should change state laws, and this is about state level, this is not federal. We should change state laws so that if you actually have a major in science, you could teach part-time. In, in small town America, there are pharmacists who know chemistry. They've taken many courses in chemistry. But they're, they don't, they're not credentialed, they don't pay union dues, and they're not gonna spend you know, all day at school. But if that small town board of education said to them, would you come in one hour a day for f you know, five days a week just to teach chemistry? They'd probably do it. Now two things would happen that would be good. The first is, you'd actually have somebody teaching chemistry who knew chemistry. This would be a stunning improvement. 50% of the teachers teaching science in America today didn't take any courses in the topic they're teaching. I mean, this is a disaster. Second, just the act of having adults wander through the buildings will improve them. Because you'll have a higher sense of discipline, a higher sense of respect, a higher sense of order. I have a third suggestion, which is even bolder, but I think absolutely will work, and I'm desperately looking for somebody to launch it. Uh, starting with the poorest neighborhoods, we should pay children 7th through 12th grade to take math and science. We should compete head-to-head -head with McDonald's and head-to-head -head with Burger King. And we should understand the hypocrisy of this culture. What do we say to kids? You want to make a lot of money? Dribble a basketball. You can make millions. You can make a half million dollars a year as a 14-year-old in playing soccer. 
You can get a scholarship to college in football, and maybe you'll make the NFL. You'll do great in baseball. You don't even have to get out of school. You can go, to, go down and play minor league ball and work your way up. Maybe you don't have any athletic talent. Can you sing? We have people who have voices that are reasonably adequate, bodies that are more than adequate, and they're doing fine. We have other people with bad bodies, you know, we have other people with bad bodies and adequate voices who are weird, and they're doing fine. <laughs> and then what do we say to everybody else? Why don't you, out of a sense of responsibility, spend your afternoons studying, sit in the laboratory, don't earn the money to go out on a date, and maybe someday, somewhere down the road, you might eventually actually get a degree in science. And then we say, gee, I wonder why we're having a hard time producing enough science majors. Now, I'm an American. I'm practical. Incentives work in America. So I'm prepared. And I'd start, let's, let's start just in the poorest neighborhood. So this, this should be a perfect liberal Democrat proposal. OK? Let's just start with the poorest neighborhoods in America and say, in every poor neighborhood in America, we will pay the children who are prepared to go out and study and pass serious tests starting in the seventh grade. What would happen? First of all, you just competed head to head with the pimps, the drug dealers, and the prostitutes as the first people in the neighborhood to have money. Second, you suddenly said the geek who up till now has been ridiculed and despised actually has money. They can go on dates Friday night because they got paid. But I'm sick and tired of being told we have to stay inside the bureaucracy that is failing and pretend the bureaucracy is central to our future. What is central to our future is people learning, not the large, cumbersome bureaucracies that surround them today and that, frankly, corrupt them. Now, what do I mean by corruption? How many of you uh, knew people in your high school who cheated on tests or cheated on papers? Raise your hand. Virtually all of you. Doesn't that give you a hint? If we build institutions so inherently corrupt that everybody thinks cheating's OK, there's something profoundly wrong with the institutions. And they need changing. The third area of change, the third big challenge is simple. China and India are going to come to play. It's not going to be an optional choice. A billion, 300 million Chinese, there'll presently be slightly more Indians, smart, hardworking, hungry and eager to have a decent life. I mean, I, th I think it's wonderful. But it's going to mean we have, we have a very simple binary choice. We can follow the European model and have elegant decay as a reasonable strategy. <laughs> or we can roll up our sleeves, look seriously at China and India, and decide on four transformations, education, litigation, taxation, and regulation. There ain't no middle ground. It, we're, either going to be, we're either going to cease to be the most powerful nation in the world. We're going to cease to be the leaders in math, science, and health. We're going to cease to be economically productive. Germany today has 12% unemployment. The European Union has 9.4% unemployment. Now, they're rich enough that they can be rich for a long time. They can transfer wealth and subsidize kids who are 30 years old. A quarter of all Germans under 30 have never had a job. They just keep transferring the wealth. You can do that for a long time. We're rich enough, we can probably last through my great-grandchildren. But we'll last as a secondary nation in the shadow of China and India. Or we decide we're going to compete for real. And if we're going to compete for real, this is going to be serious. Because these are competent, hardworking people. And today, we are not geared up, we are not prepared, and we're not even having the right debate. The fourth thing, I'm going to sound like I'm really not a conservative when I say this. The fourth thing is not a problem, it's a challenge. I get very tired of being told that we have a crisis of aging. I mean, first of all, I'll be 62 this summer, so I don't like the concept. <laughs> but second, the alternative is dramatically worse. You know, America solved its crisis of aging. Everybody's dying at 60. I mean, it takes a fairly nutty accounting viewpoint to say, oh my god, you're going to live to be 90. How can we afford it? I'll take the risk. I mean, <laughs> but what we do have to have an honest dialogue about is that if you want active, healthy aging, if you want long-term living instead of long-term care, if you want a society where people are going to live to be 90 or 100 or more, then you can't have a 1935 model of Social Security based on a transfer payment 
which the first year we had it, we had 42 workers for every retiree. Today we have three. When my two grandchildren, Maggie's five and Robert's three, when they get to be full-time workers, we're gonna have two. Now a transfer payment, when only two of you are working and one of you is receiving, is a really bad deal. And by the way, notice what the people who are opposed to personal social security accounts are saying. Oh, let's raise taxes and cut benefits. Well, let me just say to the younger students who are here, think what they're offering you. They're telling you that for every year of your working life, for 50 years, you'll pay higher taxes in order to get what? Lower benefits. This is the opposite of a free enterprise model. A free enterprise model in a world of science and technology should offer you more choices of higher quality at lower cost. My current favorite example is, how many of you have a cell phone with a camera? Just raise your hand. Okay, think, just think about that, okay? Because it's the nature of an entrepreneurial market society using science and technology to provide more choice. How many of you go to the dentist and you get x-rays while you're sitting there and you look at the x-ray with the dentist? Now, x-rays were a miracle in 1940. They're now just, oh, you gotta go to the dentist and get those x-rays again. And notice, dentists, by the way, are the preeminent preventive care people in America. They threatened to put themselves out of business by being for fluoridation, so people quit getting cavities. Did the dentist decide they had a crisis in obsolescence and job loss? No. They promptly figured out that every young lady in America had to have braces or she couldn't be in her class picture. <laughs> so even if your teeth were perfect, you needed the braces just to be part of the group. Then they discovered that wasn't working as well as they'd hoped. They have now come up with whitener. I mean, I went the other week, you know, and I had my teeth whitened. I do television so you can make an argument I needed it, but you, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't have any cavities, I don't have any gum problems, I don't have any reason to be in the dentist's office, and now I'm getting whiter teeth for an absurd price. But notice what they've done. They've given you a greater range of choices, they've given you a greater range of technology, they've taken an extraordinary magic like x-rays, they've dropped it into virtually every dental office in America. And then you get to how we think about government and healthcare, and we think about government and social security. And so we need to transform Medicare, we need to transform Medicaid, we need to go to a system which is oriented to the individual, which is based on huge quantities of data that's available through the internet, which em emphasizes prevention, wellness, early detection. It's a very different model. It's, it's not a better or worse version of the current system, it's a different system. And we'll have to go there because we will not be able to afford taking care of the baby boomers inside the current model. And so that's a great debate. The last conversation we have to have is on the nature of American culture and American civic culture. I'm very straight about this, I'm a historian. If you go to the national capital, and you go to the archives, you will see the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence says, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a very, very important assertion. Because in the American model, power comes from God to you, the individual. You are actually sovereign in a earthly sense, and you then loan power to the government, which is why the Constitution begins, we, the people of the United States of America. In the European model, the state is the center of power, and the state loans power to the citizen. There is no sense in the European tradition of inviolable rights. And I think this is a very central issue, and, and I reacted to the Ninth Circuit Court ruling that it was unconstitutional to say one nation under God with the same intensity that Lincoln reacted to the Dred Scott decision, which said that a slave was a slave anywhere in the country no matter what you tried to do. And the reason is simple. If it is literally unconstitutional to say one nation under God, I don't understand the country I'm in. Because I don't understand where my rights come from. And if people want to get up and make the assertion, we are randomly gathered protoplasm that has rationally concluded that under contract law, we have the following relationship. That's fine. But it's a very limited barrier to totalitarianism. It is, it is no accident that starting with Rousseau and the French Revolution and coming through Lenin 
Mao, Stalin, and Hitler, and Mussolini, there is a deep tradition outside the United States of you being subordinate to government and government having the right to do whatever it wants to to you because after all, you're only randomly gathered protoplasm. And I think this is a very profound argument about the nature of America and one that we need to have as a country and sort out over the next 10 or 15 years to be the kind, if, if we're going to in fact co to continue the 400 year experiment in human freedom that began literally 400 years ago in 2007 at Jamestown. So I've given you a lot of stuff to think about. I think we're going to go to questions and see what happens. All right, we now have time for questions. Um, I will give my usual uh, pitch here, which is that uh, we ask that all questioners uh, identify themselves and remind you that good questions have two characteristics. They are short and they end with a question mark. Um, there are microphones in four places, here, 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 and here. We'll just rotate around uh, and, uh, for as long as we have time. So first question right here. Hi, I'm Shay Haynes. I'm a senior at the college. And I wanted to ask you about China. Um, China's military spending uh, increased by over 12% this year. Uh, a recent article in Time Magazine uh, uh, interviewed some counterintelligence operatives, and um, they estimate there's over 3,000 Chinese intelligence agents in the US. Um, how do you think America should deal with the People's Republic of China? And how should we deal with our allies in Europe who want to sell them weapons? Well, I mean, first of all, we managed to convince the allies not to sell them weapons for the moment, partly because they looked at what the Chinese government was doing. I think our, our grand strategy should be to very aggressively reach out to the Chinese people, because to the degree the Chinese people drift towards democracy, the world is dramatically safer. I think we should hold the Chinese government accountable for infringements of human rights. Uh, and I think we should be very clear that we would, in fact, protect Taiwan. Uh, and that it would have devastating consequences for China if they tried to conquer 23 million free people. Um, I think that we should take seriously the Chinese military. I am very concerned about the defense budget this year because I think the U.S. defense budget, because I think it does not take into account uh, the level of Chinese involvement. But I would also say to you, if, if, it's fascinating. If you go to Google and, and you just look for Chinese and Indian oil deals, it's fascinating what's going on around the world right now. The Chinese have a legitimate interest in getting oil from the Persian Gulf to China. They have a legitimate interest in getting oil from Central Asia to China. This is not illegitimate. This is not a bad thing. They're going to want to have naval power to be able to do that. And I think we've got to think through how do you accommodate the rise of China while still maintaining such supremacy that they would never try to tackle it. So I wouldn't be afraid of them, but I'd worry about what we do in response. Right there. <coughs> Uh, my name is Ana Laura Balatz. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. You made a statement that uh, history is harder than, um, no, that uh, math and science is harder than history. And I agree with you, and I agree with the general statement of it being, uh, math and science being really relevant to American education. The point that you made is strongly, not only coincides, but is strongly supported and researched by the sciences of human nature, in particular brain and cognitive science. And brain and cognitive sciences and genetics and human biology in general have a lot of controversy with religion and um, not unsolvable, but they run into controversies with religion and uh, with a lot of things that have to do with uh, the Republican Party and with the way politicians deal with politics and with policy in general. I would like to know how do you think uh, the American government can deal with fostering science while at the same time it's really against some of the development sciences. One, one case would be stem cell research. So how, how, would, how would you think that the trade-off should be struck? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm very much in favor of science being dealt with on science's own terms. So that, I mean, I wanted to be a vertebrate paleontologist when I was young, and I have a big interest in paleontology and biology. Um, second, I think that on stem cell research, we should aggressively pursue it as long as it is not the product of an abortion. And I think there you've got a very deep religious sense in this country that we don't want to get into a cycle where we are paying for abortions in order to get stem cells. But I, I'm, I'm on the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation board. I strongly support finding a model by which we can do stem cell research. And I think it would be remarkably short-sighted of us to have all the stem cell research in the world going on outside the U.S. But, but if you'll notice, Bush never proposed 
that you not be allowed to do stem cell research. What Bush proposed was that there be limited government funding, and in fact, California has now passed a $3 billion stem cell program. Wisconsin has a stem cell program. And you're going to see a fairly large amount of research being done in the United States on, on stem cell research. And as long as it's not a direct product of an abortion, I'm very comfortable with finding ways to do stem cell research. Okay. Right here. Good evening, Mr. Gingrich. Uh, Brian Richardson from the uh, Kennedy School. On the uh, March 10th uh, show, Hannity and Combs, on uh, Fox News Channel, you said about Social Security um, that there's a way to put together a plan that gets us to total solvency. And you were talking about the, the Ryan Sununu plan or the, the free lunch plan. Uh, but you, like the Bush administration, failed to mention that that plan would cost $7 trillion from the general fund. And I'd like to ask, when will Social Security privatizers uh, level with the American people and say that there is no such thing as a free lunch and that it actually is going to cost us a lot of money in the future? Well, I think if you, if you read the chapter in my book, which I strongly urge you to go out and buy, uh, <laughs> you, you'll, you will see that we talk about that. I've written, op I've written op eds about it. But here's what the Ryan Sununu bill says. The Ryan Sununu bill says in order to pay for the um, transition to younger people having the right to have a personal Social Security savings account that will build up interest for 50 years, we are prepared to cap government spending at exactly the rate we had it under Clinton when I was Speaker. Now, it strikes me as a fiscal conservative, I'm pretty prepared to say the federal government has to learn to grow at one, for only eight years, by the way, at 1% less than the economy grows. That means you've got to transform the government. You've got to privatize parts of the government. I mentioned Amtrak as a starting point. It means that you have to say, we're going to, we're going to transform the health system so it's not as expensive. There are ways to do that that are better care at lower cost. I'm for forcing that level of change in government. So the bill says, yeah, and, here, and here's the choice. Do you want to pay for the transition in Social Security by cutting benefits and raising taxes? That's what the propane group is saying. You know, the government can't fix anything, so we're going to take it out of your pocket. What I'm saying is, why don't we let government bear the pain by putting government on a diet so government has to stay within spending caps? You do that for eight years, and that generates the resources that enables you to fund the, trans the transition to the Ryan Sununu uh, personal Social Security account. Right here. Uh, hi, thanks for speaking to us, Mr. Gingrich. Uh, my question is regarding <clears throat> your, your thoughts on the role of public diplomacy and national security and whether or not uh, we could maybe learn something from Europeans who aren't nearly as hated around the world as we are right now. And also, with regards to your education, uh, your policies on education, at least what you talked about today, why is it not that you are not including incentives for teachers as opposed to students? Seeing as if I was a teacher and a student was making money, whereas my salary was God knows what relative to what I could be making if I wasn't teaching, what reason do I have to go out there and teach someone math and science? Well, look, I mean, for, first of all, I'm quite comfortable saying that the qualified math and science teachers ought to be paid more if they, if they in fact can pass a merit test and actually know math and science. I'm also willing to say if you look at the D.C. public school system, which is one of the most expensive in the country, over 50 percent of the money spent by that system is spent on bureaucracy. So I'd be happy to cut the bureaucracy in half and increase teachers' salaries by 45%, but I would require them to actually know what they're teaching. Now, the teachers' union in Washington would find that anathema. I mean, you actually would have to have merit. You'd actually have to be held accountable. Uh, so I'm, I'm very prepared to talk about paying more for, I'd rather have fewer teachers with much higher salary who actually know what they're doing than have a lot more teachers who don't know what they're doing who aren't, frankly, teaching. They're, they're babysitting. So I, I'm happy to talk about, about the, the, the teacher part of that. that. That doesn't strike me as something that we're inherently in disagreement on. The, the, what was the first thing you asked? Uh, public role of public diplomacy. I'm, I'm, very, okay, I'm very much in favor of, of aggressive public diplomacy. I'm delighted that Karen Hughes is coming back, and I hope she gets confirmed and goes to work at the State Department. I think they need a dramatically new approach to it. But, but I'd, I'd make two points about the Europeans. Okay. The first is, don't overvalue how much the third world likes the Europeans. They were the colonists. Okay, we weren't. I mean, so if you if you go around the third world, you find lots of places where they're not real eager to have the former colonial powers show back up. Uh, so second, we're the most powerful nation in the world. We're exactly where Britain was in the middle of the 19th century. Any any of you who've ever been really successful know, uh, you know, that there's a point where you can't go home and flaunt it too much because your other relatives aren't as happy. 
Well, think about the pressure we put on the world psychologically. We're the most powerful militarily. Our culture permeates the planet. We're economically the most successful society in history. People just get tired of us. I mean, you know, you turn on the evening news anywhere on the planet and you see the American president. And it's not because we're out, I mean, I think we have to have much better public diplomacy, but I think we also need to understand that it requires a totally different approach on our part than you're going to get from the Europeans. Uh, the Europeans are essentially now passive in most of the world, don't take a, a responsible position morally. I mean, look at Darfur. Who was blocking Darfur? It was the French and the Chinese. And, and so I think you've got to be honest about how complicated this is. Uh, and we take a very aggressive position. We actually say to people, you ought to be free. Well, if you go out in large parts of the world, that's a very, that's, you know, it's a very radical thing to advocate freedom. And the Europeans will tell us routinely, well, they can't, you, know, you can't expect Arabs to be free. It was a great shock to them when, when you had 10 million people vote in Afghanistan, 43% of them female, uh, because it didn't fit any of the European models about the possibilities in Afghanistan. If you doubt that, go back and read the European media in, 19, in 2002 and 2003. Right here. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Green. I am from Los Angeles, California. I'm a senior. Uh, my question for you is that as the world globalizes, we are always going to have service employees in this country, and productivity increases are never going to push their wages up with kind of the natural economic increase. You can only efficiently cut hair or work at Walmart at a certain productivity. So how, without the liberal Where program, do you go for a haircut? Well, no, well, my question. I'll, I'll guarantee you beauty shops charge a lot more today than they did 20 years ago. Or am, I, am I missing something Well, with the, 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 the real wages of most service employees have uh, at the lower end have stayed pretty flat. My question of you is, without some sort of artificial inflation, like a living wage or something, how do we make sure that the people who are performing those jobs can have a good wage? Well, the first thing I would argue is you want to provide methods of ongoing education so most people don't stay on those jobs. I mean, my goal in America, historically, people arrive at the bottom of the ladder and climb. They don't arrive at the bottom of the ladder and stay. And so I'd like to see us working very hard to make sure that you may be a service worker in the sense you're describing, uh, this month, but you don't necessarily have to be a service worker eight months from now. And, and I think that's a totally different model. I, I'm not nearly as concerned about, about finding some way to artificially inflate prices, which, by the way, routinely then kills the jobs. I mean, what you then find out is people just don't hire as many people. Because it, and that is exactly the European experience. That's why a quarter of all Germans under 30 have not had a job. Because the price, they're now priced out of the market. They can't compete with Poland or, Czechos or the Czech Republic uh, or Romania. Up there. Hi, Mr. Gingrich. Uh, Dan Munoz from the Kennedy School. Uh, were you Speaker of the House today, uh, would you endorse the sort of changes in the House ethics apparatus that Speaker Hastert has endorsed uh, in order to protect uh, the House Majority Leader? Uh, and in a related question, uh, do you think that uh, uh, Majority Leader DeLay has been the victim of a vast left-wing conspiracy, or is, <laughs> or is he just a bad guy? Well, I, I mean, I think, first of all, you, you, don't have, you don't know what the outcome of the charges against delay are because you haven't seen, uh, you haven't seen any kind of report. So you've had his allegations. Uh, I think if I were the Speaker of the House today, the first thing I would do is point out over and over that Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader in October, just before the election, brought in the Democrats on the Ethics Committee and held a meeting about timing related to the election in a way that I do not believe has ever been done ever before by a leader in either party. The second thing I point out is that Tom DeLay has now said he's prepared to be investigated. He'll cooperate totally. The Republicans in the House have said they're prepared to vote to investigate him. And I find it interesting that the Democrats can't take yes for an answer. Uh, I mean, he wants to be investigated. The House Republicans want to investigate him. What's the newest excuse? Now, there was one rule that they started to change that I publicly opposed that they backed off on. And that was changing the rule that would say, if you got indicted, you have to step down. And I said flatly, it is wrong to change rules on behalf of single individuals. That's not what's happened on the other rules. The other rules changes involve the systematic manipulation of the Ethics Committee by the Democrats, where you're filing charges against a member to use in the campaign. Nothing is happening, because the absence of a majority vote the way the rules had been written meant you just stayed in limbo forever. And it struck me that, and I think I could cite many cases in the last Congress where there was clearly a deliberate subversion of the ethics process. I, I'm a deep believer in the ethics process. I have said publicly, Tom DeLay has to cooperate totally. 
I have every reason to believe from his own statements he is prepared to cooperate totally, and that is the only way I think that he can survive as leader, is, is to bring all the information, all the documents, all the material, and instruct his staff to cooperate, and fire anybody who doesn't cooperate. I mean, you cannot have non-cooperating staff. Thank you. Okay. Right up there. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Danielle Brown. I'm a senior here at the college, um, and I'm wondering why you omitted the environment and global warming and climate change from your list of big crises and how you expect that challenge to be dealt with if the United States, which consumes the most and generates the most waste, doesn't do something about it. Well, first of all, I, 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 I would include the environment very dramatically under my point about math and science. I think if we are going to be able to deal with, with environmental change in the next 25 or 30 years, it involves dramatically more breakthroughs, whether it's in biomass or it's in conservation or it's in hydrogen economies uh, or more effective use of a variety of other things. And I am, I am very concerned that we're not investing enough in the math and science necessary to do it. And second, um, while I, I used to teach environmental studies and I've served in the Wildlife Conservation Society Board, uh, and the other thing I want to do as a, as a kid, other than being a vertebrate paleontologist, is be a zoo director. I mean, I have a big interest in biodiversity and in maximizing uh, biodiversity on the planet. Uh, I would argue that, that, that it probably is on a list of 10, but I don't think it's on the list of the top five. I would not compare the environment to the other things that, uh, that I listed, but that's a value judgment. Here. Uh, for the, I'm Greg Wilson, I work here at the Kennedy School. For the first 50 years of the 20th century, Democrats controlled the South. Uh, with Christian conservative politicians telling working class and poor whites basically six things. The federal government's a threat. Federal courts don't understand the Constitution. Taxes are bad. Unions need to be eliminated. You may have a lousy hospital, but at least you're white. After the 64 Civil Rights Act, Nixon's Southern Strategy of 68, and Reagan starting his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the solid South turned Republican with conservative Christian politicians telling working class and middle class whites six things. The federal government's the enemy. Taxes are bad. The federal courts don't understand the Constitution. You may have no health insurance, but at least you're an American. Has the Republican Party nationalized the Southern segregationist governing ethos? I think you just described the kind of prejudice that makes it very hard for Democrats to win. I mean, if if, if, if you believe that's reality, your chances, of, your chances of recovering a majority are zero. Let me give you an example. When I first ran for office in 1978, my opponent was the dean of the Georgia delegation, a Georgia segregationist Democrat who refused to hold delegation meetings once Andy Young got elected because he was not going to have meetings with an, with an African American. Not the word he would have used, but he was a good Democrat. The, uh, most famous picture in the civil rights period of Bull Connor and, and the dogs in Birmingham, Connor was a Democrat. The fact is that the last great Democratic machine politician in Georgia, Tom Murphy, was Speaker of the House from Harrelson County, Georgia. His county has a single commissioner model of government. The county commissioner now in Harrelson County, Georgia, is an African-American Republican. When Murphy, who had been a state policeman, when Murphy first saw him campaigning, he walked up to him and said, how can you be campaigning as a Republican? And the guy said to him, you know, I'm a person of faith. I looked around and decided Republicans are the party for people of faith. I'm now Republican. Murphy didn't even comment. He just turned around, walked off, and was crushed. So I would argue that, in fact, you, you're seeing a very substantial change. Uh, I think it's no accident that Bush's margin in Ohio came from his having doubled the African-American vote he got in Ohio. I think it's no margin, that, no, no surprise that part of his increase in the margin in Florida was that he substantially increased his margin among African-Americans in Florida. And I think it's no accident that Bush, in fact, did better among Hispanic-Americans than any Republican in history. So I think if you think we're relying on the uh, worn-out segregationist policies of the Democratic Party of the past, I think you're just wrong. Now, you can argue about the Nixon strategy and the transition. But I don't think you can argue uh, that the party of, of Colin Powell and Condi Rice uh, is inherently following a segregationist strategy. And I think it's almost impossible to convince people of that. Okay. Hi. Uh, Speaker Gingrich, my name is Peter Liu. I'm actually a fifth year in my PhD in physics here. And I was one of those high school kids who did not get the dates on Friday because I was busy studying in lab. <laughs> 
I am, I am for your younger brother being able to date. Well, he's now working at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory, so I'll let him know. Um, I did have one question toward your uh, plan to fix uh, science and math education, obviously uh, very personal to me. You basically argued, and perhaps I'm not understanding this correctly, a bigger government strategy, whether it's paying teachers more, paying students more, and at some level, being on the receiving end of this, I have a, an experiment on the space station with NASA. It's extremely onerous having to work with the government bureaucracy yes. to get your money, and oftentimes it's not very much, particularly in the physical sciences where the NSF budget is a very small fraction of even the increases in the NIH budget because everybody wants to live longer. So at some level, the private enterprise in a bigger sense, has been the global driver of development in science and technology for a much greater period than is just in America. And I'm wondering how your strategy, what you propose to do, would be able to take advantage of that. Well, let me say, and you may not agree with us, and I'd be glad for you to comment if you strongly disagree. First of all, when you're talking about basic science, I think it's not very accurate to say that much of it has come out of private enterprise. Uh, even if you go back to the 19th century, it may have come out of foundations or it may have come out of charities. But in fact, private corporations didn't. In, private corporations used basic science, but they very seldom developed it. It was often mostly developed in institutions that were academic or that were set up for that purpose. The Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia would be a good example. Um, we've had a long tradition, you could argue, going back, for example, to the Lewis and Clark expedition of the federal government funding uh, basic research and basic knowledge. Um, I'm going to make three points. One. The biggest mistake of my speakership was not tripling the size of NSF when we doubled NIH. It is an enormous mistake. It's one I wish we would catch up on tomorrow morning. I don't care about all these budget arguments. The fact is we balance the budget while doubling the size of NIH because we set priorities. And you cannot convince me that there aren't, you know, doubling, doubling NIH, uh, NSF would uh, move it from about five to about 15 billion. You cannot convince me that we couldn't find $10 billion of stuff being done to prop up the past that we could transfer out of the current budget into NSF and have, a, you, you do it over about a three or four year period, you wouldn't do it in one year. But we should be at $15 billion before the end of this decade. Two, I have a paper I hope you'll go look at, I mentioned earlier, called Entrepreneurial Public Management, because I'd love to know from your standpoint, how should the government contract? Okay, three, um, we did a workshop at the National Academy of Engineering a couple years ago with somebody that Phil remember, Bob Walker. Uh, on the concept of prizes. And then uh, Congressman Frank Wolf is actually looking into the idea of introducing several bills on prizes. Because what I'd like to do is be able to say on a whole range of things, anybody anywhere in the country can go out and just do it. And if you achieve it, then you get the money. And that would save all the time of filling out the forms, trying to figure out who's going to read it, waiting around for something to happen. And we used prizes in aeronautics very heavily in the so 20s. And it was hugely structure. effective. Hmm? Just set up the incentive structure. Properly. Yeah, so I'd love for you to sit around and, and, and brainstorm with, with people around here on what are the 10 best prizes we could offer as the federal government so that people would go out and you'd liberate people uh, to just be productive and effective instead of having them try to, to sit around and wait for the bureaucracy to respond. I, 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 well, one thing you said, if I could disagree about slightly, are you mixing, I wonder if you're mixing things a little bit. The reason why China and India seem to be rising in competitive competition, competitiveness, is the basic competency in the basic sciences is much higher. But that, at some level, wouldn't be motivated more so by these prizes or such, or more government funding for basic no, research, but, right? that, but that, so that's why I said, if you, if you read the book, the, the chapter has like 30 specific recommendations. I mean, you just go Xerox the chapter in the, in the library. You don't have to pay anything. <laughs> but my publisher hates when I say that. But, but the point is, the, the, this, is a, this is a complex problem that has a whole series of answers to it. I would also say, in terms of space, we, we, one of the things that Bob Walker has proposed for years is, we ought to have a 10-year tax holiday for any company that makes money in space. We have to find some way for companies to decide to go out and start making money. But remember, we, we invented uh, passenger aviation by subsidizing airmail. We, we've done all sorts of things historically that are a blend of public-private. We built the transcontinental railroads by subsidizing them with grants of land and cash. Uh, you know, and I just think we ought to be practical about this. I, I just want to maximize the, 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 the pace of scientific activity in America, and I want to maximize the number of people who have competence in science that's only one of the strategies as it relates to competing with China and India. But I think it is the pivotal strategy if we're going to remain the leading country in the world. Right here. Hi, my name is Sebastian Abbott. I'm a first year here at the Kennedy School. And 
as the son of that Navy Admiral that you mentioned who was tasked with looking at international terrorism with respect to weapons of mass destruction, figured maybe I'd get up here and ask you a question about that. And wanted to, uh, you mentioned that as part of the hart Rudman Commission, you came to the conclusion that we needed a preemption strategy and was wondering whether on balance you think that the Bush administration's preemption strategy has made us safer from the risk that a nuclear weapon would be detonated here, thinking about the fact that Iraq has sort of become a breeding ground and a training ground for jihadists, potentially taking the eye off the ball for the broader war against terrorism, homeland security, and maybe showing countries that the best way to avoid preemption is to uh, develop weapons of mass destruction. Well, I think um, uh, there, there are two different parts to this. When we were describing preemption, uh, we meant something I would apply to Korea today, to North Korea, or I'd apply to our, our entering place else. If you knew the North Koreans were in the process of fueling a missile, would you wait for them to fire it, or would you take out the missile? I think our doctrine ought to be to say to them, we're surveying your country 24 hours a day, and if we think there's any danger of you firing one of these things, we're going to take out the launch site. And we ought to be very clear about that. We're not going to wait till we lose a city to decide this is dangerous. This is not like deterring the Soviets or deterring the Chinese. These are, these are nations where the leadership could decide to do things so horrendous that the consequences are, are unimaginable. Similarly, if I thought there was a ship off our shore, this happened, as you remember, with, with the, uh, the SAMs that were being shipped to Yemen from North Korea, which we intercepted. Our doctrine ought to be, if we think there's a ship offshore that has cruise missiles that could be aimed at the U.S., I don't think we wait just because it's beyond our legal limit. I think we say, if we have, if we have a suspicion that there's a terrorist nation or a, or a terrorist organization that may fire missiles at us, we're going to inspect the ship. And, and we're going to declare that as a policy. So it's a very specific kind of preemption we're in favor of. In terms of Iraq, I think you've got to ask a question that nobody who is against the war wants to ask. If, if Saddam were in power today, now that you know the scale of the corruption involved, now that you know the amount of money he was getting every year by selling oil illegally, now that you know that they, have, they had 12 biological laboratories being run by the secret police, and now that you know that there were 300,000 Iraqis in mass graves who had been killed, tortured by the, by the dictatorship, do you really think you'd be safer if Saddam was in, in power today? Despite the mess in Iraq. Now, and some of you can make that as a legitimate case, but I think it's really hard to argue that, and, and by the way, both of the reports on weapons of mass destruction said unequivocally, this guy was going to get weapons the morning he could break out. That anybody who thinks he wasn't dangerous, I mean, the first uh, ambassador who did the first report on weapons of mass destruction said he was more dangerous than we thought because he was actively, aggressively prepared to buy anything he could get from anywhere. And I think it's a big mistake to focus narrowly on, on, on whether or not he had nuclear weapons. The fact is, we know, I mean, nobody's yet explained these 12 biological laboratories. And we, we use American criminal defense standards. Well. You know, you can't prove the secret police had those 12 laboratories for terrorism. True. So what do you think the rational explanation for the 12 laboratories was? Baby food? I mean, this, this was a dangerous man. And by the way, we also know every senior general in the Iraqi army thought they had weapons of mass destruction. They internally told themselves they had them. I, I think it is inconceivable you could go back with the information we had in 2003 and have any plausible explanation other than that they had weapons, because they believed it. And that's because they lied to each other all the time. Time for two more questions, right here. Good evening, sir. My name is Hernan Olano. I am with one of the group studies of the Institute of Politics. Uh, your, the main core of your talk is about the future of America. You mentioned how important it is to include everyone in a good education and you know, develop professional development. and. Uh, you are very critical about the government being neglecting very important issues and not using common sense, and you even call it sort of a hypocritical, hypocritical attitude. Now, with all my respect, sir, I, I'm afraid that you're, I'm afraid that it, it's, a, it's a problem if you don't acknowledge the fact I mean, when you mention all the challenges that this country has, you do not, do not acknowledge the fact that 5% of the population of the United States is made out of undocumented illegal aliens. That's one out of 20. 
In other words, it's like from in this room, the people from here till the end are undocumented illegal aliens. And yet this is an issue that you do not address, that you don't say anything about it. In the year 2050, one out of four Americans is gonna be a Hispanic. We are breeding a horrendous underclass, an insidious situation that politicians neglect. Today, for example, a motion do you, by. Do you have a question? Yes. What do you say about that, the motion of? Uh, <laughs> Well, first of all, I mean, I talk a fair amount about, about both the question of controlling the border, which I think is a, an issue of national security, and of the whole notion of what I call in the, in the book patriotic education and patriotic immigration. Uh, I believe that we ought to have very real controls at the border, including, our, including the coast. I think that we should have a green card program, which is fairly uh, widespread, which basically says if you want to come to the U.S., to earn a living legally uh, while working and paying taxes. If you'll give us a biometric, probably an iris scan, uh, we will allow you to do that. I would, uh, I would require every current illegal to go home to get the card, and the reason is very practical. We do not want, I mean, th think about the role right now, somebody sitting in Guatemala City obeying the law, waiting for their visa, while their cousins all call them from Boston to say you're stupid. I mean, you either decide to reward illegality or you decide to reward obeying the law. I would also change the deportation rules so that we can deport illegals in 72 hours and not follow this, 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 this foolishness that you are constructively inside the American legal system even if you are illegal. Uh, and I would make citizenship very uh, open to people who can pass an American history test in English. I'm, I am very pro-legal immigration. And I think I am, and I am very pro a, a green card worker program, but within a system that is very tough on illegals and a system that is very tough on controlling the border. And I think it's a complex issue. Uh, I, I don't think, by the way, that, that Hispanic Americans are gonna form an underclass. Hispanic Americans are gonna do exactly what we've seen historically, uh, and, and there's a wonderful book by Michael Barone on this, uh, talking about the new Americans. Hispanic Americans come to America to rise. They work very, very hard. Uh, they they uh, try to encourage their family to rise. They try to buy houses. They try to save. They're very interested in getting ahead in life. And I think over two or three generations, they're going to, in fact, become absorbed by the American experience. And I, I, don't, I, I don't look, I'm, I'm not frightened of some wave of immigrants coming to America as long as they come here to become Americans. But I think we have to have a real debate over the notion that we are, we are not going to, in fact, become a country uh, which allows people to come in illegally in large numbers. The, I think the actual numbers now are about uh, 10 million uh, illegals. Uh, and I think it is an issue that has to be addressed, and I'm perfectly prepared to address it. Last question. I also think that there are a couple of major challenges missing from your list. Um, the first challenge being a social one. We have millions of Americans living in poverty, millions of Americans without health insurance. Our education system is failing our children and rife with inequalities. Racial inequalities exist across the board. Um, second challenge echoes something we heard earlier, and that is an energy challenge in our uh, dependence on fossil fuels, which has implications across the board, including in national security, and I do not believe can be solved, is, is, made, is simply a science failure, but it is also a failure of political will. Um, and I would argue that both of those challenges trump many of the five that you listed, and I was just wondering where you think they fit in the scheme of things. Okay, well, there, there are two different questions. I mean, the, the, on the issue of inequality, as you notice I said earlier, I would, I would be happy to start by paying students to, to study math and science in the poorest neighborhoods. And if you, if you actually went out and, and focused on every poor neighborhood in America, and you were prepared to pay every child from seventh through 12th grade as one to study math and science, the number of people who'd end up becoming accountants and who would end up becoming scientists and who would end up becoming medical doctors would be dramatically higher. So you would be disproportionately reaching out to the very people you care about. Uh, we have a, a chapter in the book on, on health transformation. I founded the Center for Health Transformation, and I wrote a book called Saving Lives and Saving Money. 
I think we ought to have a 21st century intelligent health system in which every single American is included in the insurance programs and in which every single American is included uh, in, in a personal health knowledge system which is internet based and you would do more to eliminate disparities in health by involving everybody in that kind of a system. We're actually working on a model we're launching in Georgia designed to eliminate disparities in health. So I don't disagree with you. And by the way, nobody has been cheated more by the collapse of public schools than the poor. It is the poor who have paid the price of unionized bureaucracy failing. And we have consistently refused to be honest about that and to take head on the issue of why do we tolerate schools that destroy the poor. So I would be with you in trying to find a way to reform the school system so the poorest kids actually had a decent future. Because the answer to poverty is to get enough education to get a good job to not be in poverty. And to do that, you've got to have the support mechanisms that today serve as traps for, the, for, the, uh, for people who are poor. On energy, let me, let me point out something people don't like to talk about. Gasoline has been historically too cheap to get to an alternative. I want you to, you're nodding yes, but I want you to think through what I just said. I, I don't believe in artificially inventing pain because 25 years from now I think something could happen. Gasoline has literally been, gasoline peaked in, in the late 70s under regulatory control by the government. Ronald Reagan's first act as president was to deregulate it. The market promptly crashed the price of gasoline and it has never again recovered. So you are today having gasoline, which is in constant dollars, as of this morning, $33 below the 1970s in constant dollars. So I'm not sure I want to go out and say to the American people, let me raise your taxes to create enough pain to force you to change. I am prepared to go out and say, let's have the right research, let's figure out what we need to do, uh, and let's figure out how we can get it. And you and I just disagree about the power of science. I, 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 example, there's a trillion, 200 billion barrels of oil in the Rockies in shale oil. Now, we don't know today how to get it out efficiently and in an and, and environmentally sound way, but there's a trillion, 200 billion barrels. That's a huge quantity of oil just sitting there. The Canadian tar sands are massive. We don't quite know how to use them. Biomass potentially is directly competitive with petroleum. Uh, and there are systems being developed that are amazingly modern in using biomass. In fact, fuel oil could probably be replaced for most of New England uh, by the correct kind of, of biomass uh, system. So I am a technological optimist, but I'll just close with this thought. I mean, think about where you are. You're at a place which is almost 400 years old and which has been the product. I mean, your entire endowment is a function of technological opportunity. This is the, we have had a long run as a human race of inventing more tools of greater power to enrich more lives. I see no reason that that's not going to be true in the next uh, generation. And I think the trick for us is to try to so organize our society that we maximize the opportunity for people to have the knowledge and we maximize the opportunity for people to go out and create the, the, the wealth of the future. And if we do that, I think, frankly, we will continue to be the most successful society in history. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you and have a good evening.